Praise God. Praise God. Let's take our Bibles this morning and uh, let's return to the book of Joshua as we have been preaching through this whole book. We find ourselves in chapter 20 of the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 20. I want you to find a cross-reference also in Deuteronomy 19 and Exodus 34. Finding refuge from the penalty of God's justice. Joshua chapter 20, for the cross-reference, Deuteronomy 19 and Exodus uh, 34. <coughs> Joseph's sledge was set free Friday, January 23rd, 2015, after a three-judge panel found that he was innocent of a 1976 killing of a mother and a daughter. After the 70-year-old was released, Sledge said that he was really looking forward to going home and just doing the most mundane things. Going home, relaxing, and sleeping in a real bed. The lawyer who took his case in 2004, Christine Muma, she said that she had been on the verge of giving up and closing the case in 2012. Then court clerks while cleaning out an evidence vault, discovered a misplaced envelope containing hair from the crime scene. The envelope contained hair found on the victim and believed to be the attackers. Well, this turned out to be a key piece of evidence needed to do DNA testing, which wasn't available uh, when Sledge went on trial back in 19. 78. So the case was referred to the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission in 2013. The commission is the only state-run agency of its kind, and since 2007, it has reviewed and closed nearly 1,500 cases. The judges considered the commission's investigative file and a DNA expert highlighted lab tests in her testimony. Megan Clement of Cellmark Forensics said that none of the evidence collected from the scene, hair, DNA, fingerprints, none of it belonged to Sledge. The key jailhouse informant, Herman Baker, signed an affidavit in 2013 recanting trial testimony. Baker said he lied at the 1978 trial after being promised leniency in his own drug case. And he said that he had been coached by authorities on what to say at Sledge's trial. Testimony from another jailhouse informant was inconsistent according to the commission documents and that informant had died in 1991. The victims, Josephine Davis, 74 at the time, and daughter Eileen, 57, were stabbed to death in September of 1976. They were found at their home in Elizabethtown a day after Sledge had escaped from a prison work farm where he was serving a four-year sentence for larceny. Oh, so you've got a record. You were in the area. You must be guilty. At the age of 31, Sledge was wrongfully convicted of two counts of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison after 39 years in jail. He was exonerated and released. You know, it's, it's sad when the innocent are the bearers of judicial punishment while the guilty get off scot-free. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. 
the justice of men is imperfect. Amen. But the same cannot be said about the justice of God. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 20 is an illustration of the wisdom and perfection of God's justice. Will you look with me to Joshua chapter 20 and verse number 1. The Lord also spoke unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spoke unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that kills any person unawares and unwittingly may flee there or may run there, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Skip down to verse number 7. And they appointed Kadesh in Galilee in Mount Naphtali and Shechem in Mount Ephraim and Kuriath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountain of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan River by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. God's justice is accessible. See, if we only had Joshua 20, we would wonder about much of the detail in these words. That the cities of refuge, uh, they're mentioned four times in the law of Moses. In Exodus chapter 21, Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 19. God did not detail these cities of refuge in this chapter because he understood that his people knew the law of Moses. They, they knew about these. So in order for us to kind of know the same background, we need to review quickly uh, the, the, the writing of the lawgiver, Moses. Out of the four times that Moses references the cities of refuge, Deuteronomy 19 best summarizes the teaching of the law. So I want you to look back at Deuteronomy 19 right now and verse number 1, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse number 1. When the Lord your God has cut off the nations whose land the Lord your God gives you, and you succeed them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall separate three cities for you, in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God gives you to possess it. You shall prepare you a way and divide the coasts of your land, which the Lord your God gives you to inherit, into three parts, that every slayer may flee there. And this is the case, uh, for example, he said, of the slayer, which shall flee there, that he may live. Whoso kills his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hates not in time past, as when a man, for example, goes into the woods with his neighbor to cut down some wood uh, for the fire or to build something, and his hand fetches a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head of the axe slips off from the helve or the, the handle, and lights upon his neighbor, or, or hits him upside the head, that's the uh, uh, loose translation there, and he dies. Then that one who was swinging the axe, he's going to run unto one of those cities and live, lest the avenger of the blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him, uh, because the way is long and killing, whereas he was not worthy of death, inasmuch as he hated not him in time past. Wherefore I command you, saying, You shall separate three cities for you. And if the Lord your God enlarge your coast, and given uh, as he sworn unto your fathers, and give you all the land which he has promised to give unto your fathers, if you will keep 
keep all these commandments to do them, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to walk ever in his ways, then you shall add three cities more for you beside these three. The innocent blood be not shed in your land, which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance, and so blood be upon you. But if any man hates his neighbor, lies in wait, premeditated, and rise up against him, and strikes him mortally that he die, and flees into one of these cities, then the elders of the city shall send and fetch him there, and deliver him unto the hand of the avenger of blood, that he may die. Your eyes shall not pity him, but you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel, that it may go well with you. <clears throat> You know, as we read passages like this and, and, and we just begin to think, what is it that God wants us to understand and why is this in our Bibles? And if this, this is it. God takes note of the motives and the intents of our heart. Right. He sees the heart and our right. intents. See, a man without a murderer's heart should not suffer a murderer's penalty. The Lord provided these cities of refuge as temporary places of asylum. Now you got to understand, back in Joshua's day, it's not like our day. In Joshua's day, the state at that time did not avenge a killing. <coughs> it was the responsibility of the family to exact revenge on a perpetrator, whether it was accidental or not. It was the responsibility of the family. So a near relative would get his uh, axe or his spear, get his gun, and he would take after this perpetrator who had maybe killed uh, one of his family members, uh, the man or the woman. And he became what was known as the avenger of blood. So let's say if I, if I accidentally killed one of your brothers or sisters, or, or maybe I accidentally run over one of your children with, with my vehicle, then my first thought, my first thought would be to get to the city of refuge immediately, as fast as I could. Once you know God's city of refuge is easily accessible. Three on the east side, three on the west side of the Jordan River. All six cities were placed on high profile hills or mountains. The roads to these cities were plainly marked. It was Jewish commentators who say it was a law in Israel back in that day that one day in every year there were persons sent out to repair the roads leading to the cities of refuge. They were to remove all stumbling stones which might over time have fallen in the way and to see also that the signposts which were set up at every intersection leading to the city were carefully preserved and in well keeping. And the name Miklat, which is Hebrew for refuge, was in large legible letters. The English translation of these cities' names represent sanctuary. On the east side of the Jordan, I want you to see this on our Bible map here. On the east side of the Jordan River, they had a city of refuge in the north. It was Kadesh, which means holy. And then in the central section of the country, there was Shechem, which means shoulder. And then in the south part of the country was Hebron, which means fellowship. On the west side of the Jordan River, in the north, there was the Golan, which means exaltation. And in the central part, Ramoth, which means height. And in the south, Bezer, which means fortress. So no matter wherever we lived in Israel, there was always a city of refuge nearby. 
spiritual application to ourselves. Well, today, wherever we live, there is. God has a city of refuge nearby. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 6, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge. Direct reference to these cities. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Say amen. 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 That hope being referred to in Hebrews chapter 6 is Jesus Christ. Say amen. 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 See, accidental or on purpose. It does not matter. We have all sinned against God. Right. And the penalty of our sin is death. Right. But if we get to God's city of refuge, which is Jesus Christ, we will be forgiven. You believe that? Say amen. amen. God's city of refuge which for us is faith in Jesus Christ, is easily accessible. Our Heavenly Father has cleared the road and plainly marked the way. Jesus said, I am the way. Amen. The truth and the life no man comes to the Father but by me. You see, God's justice as he deals with all of us, God's justice is pure enough to always punish the guilty, but fair enough to always give refuge to the innocent. Amen. He will always punish the guilty, whether in this life or the life to come. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will repay. Amen. But he's always fair enough to give refuge to the innocent. God's justice is accessible. God's justice is equitable. I want you to look at verse number 4, back in Joshua chapter 20. Look at verse number 4. And when this manslayer doth flee into one of those cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of the city. They shall take him into the city unto them and give him a place and that he may dwell among them. And if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up unto his hand because he has struck his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. It wasn't meditated murder. It was an accident. And he shall dwell in that city of refuge until he stand before the congregation for judgment. We would understand until he stands trial before the congregation to discern his status and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return after the high priest dies. He can go back to his home, come into his own city, come back into his own house, and to the city from whence he fled. See, as we look at this, we understand Joshua chapter 20 just inhales and exhales the sanctity of human life. I mean, the, the, the very fact that there were cities of refuge assumes the precious value of the unintentional manslayer's life. What? Just as sacred is the deceased person's life. 
American justice system, too often the victim is demoralized and humiliated while the criminal's rights are honored and upheld. In God's justice system, all is equitable. Amen. Both the victim's life as well as the perpetrator's life is sacred and valued. God's justice is pure enough to always punish the guilty, either in this life or in the life to come. His justice is always fair enough to give refuge to the innocent. So God's justice is accessible. God's justice is equitable. But I want you to look back again at verse number 6, because God's justice, thank the Lord, is satisfiable. Verse number 6 again. And he, and he shall dwell in that city until he stands trial before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then he can return home back to his own city and his own place where he fled. You see, the manslayer's release on the day of the high priest's death points the satisfaction of God. God is satisfied. God's justice is satisfied. Now, under Old Testament law, in the case of some crimes where capital punishment was the prescribed penalty, they also allowed, if you had the money, you could ransom your life and pay the pay the the, uh, the offended pay the one you committed the crime against a large sum of money and they and they would not take your life. Well, under Mosaic law, no such buyout, no such option is available for murder or manslaughter. According to the Bible, the reason is when a person dies an unnatural death by someone else's hand, it, it causes the their blood pollutes the land, pollutes the earth and the creation. Only the blood of the blood shedder or an acceptable substitute can atone for the sin. Death is the only ransom that can satisfy the claims of God's justice. Why don't you? Now, suppose I was speeding, I don't know, let's be conservative here, 60, <laughs> in a 30 zone. Let's say I was caught in order to appear in court. And the judge asked me, sir, are you guilty or not guilty? And I'd have to answer, I am guilty, Your Honor. And he says, okay, that'll be $300 or 30 days in jail, your choice. I'm telling you guys, I know this, trust me, there ain't no $25 tickets in here, okay? <laughs> trust me, trust me. So he says, there'll be $300 or 30 days in jail. Well, I don't have any money. I'm just the lowly parson here, you know what I mean? I, I don't have any money to pay this penalty. And so I'm going to have to go to jail in order to pay the penalty. But suppose in this situation that the judge is my dad. Uh, and my dad really loves me. Right. And he doesn't want to see me suffer in jail for what I've done. Right. Well, as a just judge, and so justice can be maintained. His position demands, it demands that I be sentenced just like anyone else. Right. So here's the problem in my dad's mind. How can my father maintain his justice and at the same time demonstrate his way he could do it would be to go ahead and sentence me and then step down, lay aside his robe, pull out his wallet, and acting as my father, pay the penalty for me. Amen. Yeah. That's exactly how God satisfied his justice and 
his love for us. Amen. That's why the Bible says he can be just and the justifier. God satisfied his own justice. Amen. So he sentenced me. God sentenced me to death because of my sins. Right. And then God stepped down off of the throne of judgment. Right. And he laid aside his robes. Yeah. And he paid the penalty of death. For me by dying on the cross of Calvary. Say amen. 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 Glory to God. Yeah. And he did it because God's holiness cannot overlook sin. Amen. In fact, the Lord God of heaven and earth will by no means clear the guilt. The death penalty must be paid for sin. This is where I want you to look back at Exodus chapter 34. Look at Exodus 34 when God was revealing himself to Moses in this chapter for the very first time. Who is this God that's leading us out of Egypt to bondage? Who is this God? What is your nature? Who are you? Tell me about yourself. And in Exodus 34 verse number 6, the Bible said that the Lord passed by before Moses. And the Lord proclaimed about himself these words. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Watch. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and to the fourth generation. You see, God is not soft on sin. Amen. God is not like our grandfather who says, oh, what boys will be boys. Oh, little sweetie, honey doll, you're, you're okay. Don't worry about it. God is not like a heavenly granddaddy up there. Right? God is holy, righteous, just, and true. Amen. And he cannot overlook our sin. Therefore, the sentence for all of us is death. Right. He also loves us. He stepped down, took off his robe, and died for us. Amen. To pay our penalty. See, God, justice is pure enough to always punish the guilty, whether in this life or in the next life. But he's right. fair enough to always give refuge to the innocent. Look back at Joshua chapter 20 for the last verse of the chapter. We find that God's justice is accessible. God's justice is equitable. God's justice is satisfiable. And then the last verse tells us that God's justice is universal. Look at verse number 9. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel. And. Huge word there. And. For the stranger that sojourns or travels among them. And whoever kills any person 
Testament teaches us that everything that happened to Israel back in that day is written in this Bible so that we could read it and learn about it. And we can learn from it. And it's an example to us. And it's there to admonish us for our admonition, the New Testament tells us. Let me tell you, we need to look to Jesus as our city of refuge. Say amen. Amen. And by faith in Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection will be spared. We will be spared. We'll be saved. We'll be saved from the penalty of our sin. Psalm 91 verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. Amen. And my fortress. My God in Him will be. Amen. Glory to God. God's justice is pure enough to always punish the guilty, whether in this life or the next. It's going to happen. But He's also fair enough and loves us enough to give refuge to the innocent. Oh, we're not innocent. He makes us innocent with His righteousness. 